Great. So welcome to day two. Again, this is anchored by the Jesus things of the Shining Life Family Church. We drive to become an interdenominational, non-denominational Christian apologetics affiliated hangout. So if you're a Christian campus fellowship, be it um, secondary or uh, university, polytechnic, whatever, and you want to invite us to discuss Christian apologetics related matters, you are free to reach out to us. We'll be meeting every Sunday evening, eight to nine. Um, for the first two months today, I'll be meeting on a uh, weekly basis. And thereafter, we might move it to fortnightly. So you're welcome again. The meeting ID on Zoom remains the same there on the screen. In case you are um, seeing this on Facebook or YouTube, you can always join us on Sundays. I will do a quick revision of what we discussed the last time. We started out by saying that several young people have an idea of what um, we believe. They have the an idea of the what do we believe question, right? They basically have an idea based on observation and the fact that many of them um, have parents who are religious. So they go to church, they hear sermons, and they have an idea of what we believe. They know some of our slangs like... Um, righteousness, holiness, Holy Spirit, and uh, some of those things, <clears throat> right? And the problem most times is that there are unanswered whys. Why do we believe in, in these things? Why do we choose to believe what we believe? And many times um, answers to these whys are not um, provided. And when there are no answers to why it leads to loss of identity or a shape shifting identity, which finally, or, or, or a lack of identity in total. Just a moment, please. All right. So, um, so we proceeded to say, and if this problem is not, I think this problem is not big enough, we now have an even bigger delusion of how. So many times we can't answer why we believe what we believe. And then we have a bigger problem of how do we arrive at what we believe? How do we arrive at saying Jesus Christ is the only way when Christianity is in the oldest religion upon the face of the earth? There are other religions that, that, uh, that were existing before um, Christianity. Even Abraham, um, came off from a particular place, right? And, and they were not traditionally Jews per se as at that time. So why are we singling out Christianity? Why do we believe what we believe? How did we arrive at the conclusion, right? So when these questions can't be answered, when we can't proffer logical and spiritual mind um, thought provoking answers to these questions, then it brings um, many youth and many people to a position where they go into high institution, people present other views to them, and then they begin to believe and then begin to doubt uh, Christianity um, as a whole. Today we'll be focusing on the five fundamental doctrines of Christianity. If you give someone else to, to do this presentation, they might present some other um, things that might not be included in these five or <clears throat> or they might change these five um, briefly. But whatever the case, I believe that every Christian, every Christian congregation denomination, or every denomination, a group of people who could be called Christians must agree and should agree to these five fundamental doctrines. And at the last presentation, we saw how we have different denominations in Christianity, in, in Christendom. Um, however, each of them should agree on certain things. You have to believe in something to be called a Christian. Not everybody is a Christian. Not everybody who believes in Jesus is a Christian, right? Even the Muslims do believe in Jesus and they believe he's, um, he's a prophet, right? They believe he's sinless. They believe he performed some miracles that are not even written in the Bible, like um, molding um, birds from, from, the, from the mud and then giving it life, right? They do believe in Jesus, but that doesn't make them Christian. So what are some of the 
five fundamental doctrines of Christianity. Number one, God exists, right? So Christians are theists. We believe that God exists. And it will surprise you to know that when you mention the concept God, it has different definitions for different people. But in Christianity, we believe that the God we're talking about is an immaterial God. Is an immaterial God. He's a spirit and not made of matter. So he's not like Dagon. He's not like the calf that the children of Israel carved when Moses went to the mountain for 40 days. And then they were saying, we were trying to worship that golden calf. He's an immaterial God, right? It is, he's not plastic, he's not wood, he's not mud, he's not silver. He's not the sun, he's not Ra, he's not thunder. He's immaterial. His spirit not made of matter. Of course, matter is um, anything that has weight, occupy space and, and all of those um, stuff, right? He's infinite. The God we refer to in Christianity is an infinite God. He's in, unlimited and completely actualized. He can't become better. You won't say uh, there's something he needs to become. He, he's unlimited and is completely actualized. He cannot be made better than what he already is. He's an infinite God, right? He is self-existing. He is the uncaused cost, right? Nobody created him. If somebody, if, if you have a God that was created by something, then the creator becomes the God. So it looks stupid when men mold uh, mud and then say that is their God. When men mold and um, carve out trees and then attribute um, God, Godship to that. The God we worship in Christianity is self-existing. He is the uncaused cause. He brought everything to being, yet he himself was not created. That separates us from several other religions upon the face of the earth, right? Yes, he is spaceless. He transcends time. He's, you can't confine him. In fact, the God who created, when if you look at John Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, God created the heavens. In the Bible says, in the beginning, which is time, God created the heavens, which is space, and the earth, which is matter, right? So he's the God. Uh, in the beginning, we, we saw the creation of space, time, and matter, right? Space, time, and matter. And um, 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 Dr. Covind made, it on, made us understand that it was the trinity of a trinity. So space itself has three we have um it is either um, um x axis y axis and, and and the z axis right then if you talk about time it is past present and the future right and if you talk about um matter you're talking about solid liquid gas right the bible told us in genesis chapter one in the beginning god created those three things space matter and time and the god who created space matter and time exists outside of space, matter and time. The creator of Toyota cannot be found inside Toyota. The creator of Dell computer cannot be found inside Dell computer. When people try to find God inside his creation, then their concept of God is, is, is wrong. Or rather, better put, it's not the Christian God we're talking about. The Christian God is spaceless. You can't find him inside of space. Because he created space, right? You can't find him inside of matter. He's immaterial, right? And it's unlimited, self-existing. The Christian God is timeless, like I mentioned, Trinity of Trinity. He transcends time. He's eternal. You can't put time to God. No wonder he said, I am the beginning and the end. He, he sees everything. He, he transcends time. That is the God of Christianity, right? Some other God, some other people have, um, if you remember when, when, when um, one of the apostles of Jesus Christ, I think Paul, went to a particular, I think it was Antioch or so, and they got there and they saw um, certain, a part, um, 
some set of people who were worshiping different gods and they had a shrine dedicated to the unknown God, right? We have so many other um, religions that have a God for fertility, the God for um, harvest, the God of something. The Christian God transcends time, is eternal, transcends um, space, right? And is also immaterial. That's the Christian God. He's omnipotent, meaning that he's all powerful. The Christian God is omnipotent. He's all powerful, right? That is one attribute of the God we look. And he's omnipresent. He's everywhere present. Again, this, this beats the imagination of a normal man. How can somebody be everywhere? I know Christians don't, don't, don't just say God is everywhere. They say he's all powerful. I mean, he's inside, he's in Sahara Desert right now. He's in UK right now. He's in Australia, the other end of the world. He's in somewhere, he's everywhere. He beats our imagination as humans because we can't, we, we don't even know what is going to happen the next minute. We don't know what is what our neighbor is thinking about. It beats our imagination that there is a being that can be all powerful and also present everywhere. Yet that is the Christian God. That's the definition of the Christian God. He is immutable, meaning that he's unchangeable. Of course, it tallies with point number one. He's completely actualized. If he can change, then he means it means that he's not actualized. Right? He's immutable. I mean, he doesn't have parts. When you see things that have parts, it means they are not complete. They are at some point they could not be complete. He's immutable, he's unchangeable. He remains the same. And if you go through the Bible, you see names for God that tallies with each of these um, attributes here. Immutable, unchangeable, ever present, all powerful. That's the Christian God, right? And any group of persons who preach or teach about any or believe in any other God that doesn't have these attributes, even if they put Christians behind their name, we know that they are not Christians because this is the God of the Bible, right? He's personal. He has mind, emotion, will, and he also makes choices. The Bible tells us that God has mind, emotions, and he makes choices. He's personal. Right now, everything that was said prior to this time, up to this personal, can be concluded outside of the Bible. We don't need the Bible to actually conclude, to make, to actually arrive at this conclusion, right? And subsequent discussions, we'll be looking at how did we arrive at this conclusion. I remember the introduction. The, the, the what we believe, the why, and the how. We'll actually pick each of these, if not all of them, and look at how did we arrive at this from the Bible? How do we arrive at some of these decisions outside the Bible from observation? How did we arrive at them, right? So the Christian God is a triune God. He's three persons in one divine essence. He's three persons in one divine essence. Some people say that God is three in one, right? That is three God in one God. No, he's three persons, not three gods in one God. He's three persons in one divine essence, right? And in this subtopic, we'll get to discuss it later on. Jesus is fully God. So if you have some set of people who say Jesus is Archangel Michael, those are not Christians. We have JWs and some other people who believe Jesus is um, um, an angel or something. They are not Christians. We have Muslims who say Jesus Christ is the prophet. They are not Christians. So that was why we said at the beginning, you might believe in Jesus, but that doesn't make you a Christian. Even the devil believes in Jesus. Remember that, um, that um, demon-possessed man? 
the man that was possessed by a lot of demons, when, his, when, when the demon saw Jesus, they, the, the man ran to Jesus and bowed down, right? But they are not Christians. They are not, they are not good beings, right? So be, knowing, knowing Jesus, in quotes, or believing that Jesus exists doesn't make one a Christian. So in, in Christianity, we believe in the triune um, persons in one divine essence um, of God. And we believe that God is holy, set apart, morally perfect. But when we come to start discussing the, the moral concept of God, we will look at how atheists and many other people who try to play down Christianity and bring up other forms of religion try to use this aspect to fight against God um, when they say that if God is moral, morally right, why is it? Why did he uh, um, kill several persons in the Old Testament in, in the bid of keeping um, Israel? We'll get to that and we'll look at it scripturally and, and um, from the apologetic point of view. So when we say one, one of the things we believe, fundamental belief of Christianity is that God exists. These attributes here may not be exhaustive, but they more or less capture what we believe from the Bible about God and the God we worship. We don't worship a God that is not infinite and all of that, right? In Isaiah chapter 40, 25, 26, New International Version, God was talking and he said, to whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? If you look to the heavens, what do we see? Depending on what time of day. If it's at night, you see the stars. And scientists make us understand that there are galaxies and that the, the, the earth is spinning around the sun and the sun is also spinning and, and that the whole universe is basically expanding. God said, lift up your eyes. Whether you're looking at it through a telescope, through your naked eyes or whatever, look to the heavens. Who created all this? Who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name? All the starry hosts, the stars we see up there, we don't, we, 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 we usually say they are uncountable. The Bible makes us understand that the God that we serve he brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Right? Now, if you are science inclined, you know how vast the universe is. We'll, we'll go deep into them maybe in the second or third week of our uh, month of our discussion. You see, we'll, we'll look at the universe and how vast and how minute and how small the earth is compared to the universe and how big some of these stars are, much, much more bigger than our own sun, which is several times bigger than the earth. And the Bible says he calls each of them by name. That is the God, the, the Christian God. Any other form of God we know or people worship isn't the Christian God. It will have, it will not have all of the attributes here. It may have some of the attributes um, attributed to it, but it definitely will not have all of these attributes. Second thing, fundamental belief of Christianity is that the Bible is God's word. We believe the Bible is God's word. We believe the Bible is true and is the standard for truth. And anything that goes against the Bible is basically false. We believe the Bible reveals God's mind for and to us and should have authority over our everyday life. So we don't take the Bible, we don't read the Bible, you know, carelessly. We try to understand the mind of God. We try to understand what is written. We try to dig deep to understand the, the contents. The Bible interprets itself. Um, in, in, um, in studying the Bible, there's what they call Bible and scripture interprets scripture. It interprets itself. It is inspired by, by God. When we continue to, of course, inspired by God, um, but written, but written um, by men. Like I mentioned, this is just an introduction. We will come to each of these um, points as, as time goes on over the months. 
and dig deep into each of them. We'll look at um, biblical history and the likes. Part of what we'll be looking at is the canonization. Um, every, almost every religion has a canon, right? Um, a, a set of books that they believe is, um, they revere and they believe is, um, is holy or um, written by God or dropped by God, whatever the case, right? And in Christian, in Christianity, we, we, we um, in past we had a process of canonization. How did we arrive at these sixty-six books? There are several other books. If you if you meet some people in the Catholic Church, um, they have some other um, books added to the sixty-six books. There are some other books like the Book of Enoch and several other ones, the Book of the uh, of Judas and several other books that are not in the 66 books. How did we arrive at the 66 books that we today call the Bible? Right? How did we even get to the point where we have chapters and verses? We'll look at each of those things. Obviously, I hope, you, I hope everyone here knows that um, the writers, the original writers of the Bible, they didn't put chapters or verses. Just imagine writing a letter to somebody. Um, um, you wouldn't put chapter or verses. You know, but those chapter of verses were put in some maybe 500 years ago and it, they were necessary. Imagine going to church and um, your pastor said, open to, um, open your Bible to like um, two thirds, two thirds, um, to, towards the end, um, the two third. Um, and, you know, it becomes difficult to, to say specifically where he wants you to open, right? So that's why we have chapters and verses. It helps us, you know, go through the scriptures easily and pinpoint. But that was not how it was. So how did we arrive at selecting those 66 books that we today call the Bible? And how did we arrive at chapters and verses? We'll discuss those as we move on under canonization. But the main point here is that one of the fundamental beliefs of Christianity is that the Bible is God's word. And we believe that we are saved by faith in Jesus. Point number three. Christians believe that they are saved by faith in Jesus. We believe that we as humans failed God. It's a fundamental belief of Christianity, that humans failed God, right? And we believe that we can't save ourselves. Fundamental belief of Christianity, we can't save ourselves. And that Jesus happened, uh, the sacrifice of Jesus paid for our sins. Number one, we as humans failed God. Number two, we can't save ourselves. And the sacrifice of Jesus paid for our sins. These are fundamental beliefs of Christianity under the subtopic we are saved by faith in Jesus. Christianity is the only, permit me to use the word religion, where our relationship, where our um, dealings with God is relational. It's not autocratic. It's like relational. We believe that we can't save ourselves and that God had to create a, a way for us to be saved. Every other religion tells you what you need to do to be in the good books of God. Christianity tells us what God did for us to be in his good books. Every religion tells you set of rules and do's and don'ts you need to do so that you can please God. Christianity tells us what God did to put us in a position where we can please him. Very interesting. We believe that we are saved by faith in Jesus, even in the Old Testament. Even in the Old Testament, it was pointing to Jesus. They sacrificed lamb. But by faith, they were actually looking onto Jesus Christ. They looked onto the serpent that was raised, the brazen, the brazen serpent. By faith, they were actually looking onto Jesus. So both the Old Testament and the New Testament, everything was Jesus. The Old Testament was a shadow of things to come. The New Testament was the real thing. So in Christianity, we will believe that we are saved by faith, not by works, by faith 
in Jesus Christ. Praise God. So um, let's move on. Number four, second to the last, we believe that there is life after death. Fundamental, fourth fundamental belief of Christianity is that there is life after death. We believe there is what we call eternity, that there is more to this life, that physical death on earth is not the end. There are sev several people who, several religions that believe on in, in some other variants, like some believe that once you are dead, you are dead and gone, especially um, these new age religions coming from the West. Um, um, in one of our study, we we'll, would we'll, we'll, we'll look at science as a religion, right? There's a, a, a brand of science that's been pushed now that is anti-Christ and it is pushed and they try to merge it together with the normal science that seeks to discover what God has created or how, um, how uh, the workings of nature, which is basically science, there's a, some um, brand of um, uh, people now pushing an, another agenda, adding it to that, and they try to form some form of um, 80s um, belief, which is actually a religion. We will look at that. I think um, by next Sunday, our topic will be, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Uh, we'll be looking at, uh, at that. We'll look at some of those things. I think we'll discuss that for like three or four weeks. So we believe that there's life after death. Some believe that we are just um, um, we are just conscious gels, you know, conscious combination of um, some elements moving, and that very soon we, we derive all of our energy from the sun, and when we die, we decay, and that is all about life. Some people believe that. Christians don't believe that. Some believe that when you die, you get reincarnated based on your deeds now. If you do well, you reincarnated as a better human. If you do bad, you could reincarnated as a, as a, a, um, you know, a lower creature, maybe as a cow, even as earthworm and everything, right? Several things in Christian in, in Christianity, we believe that there is life after death, but not reincarnation. We don't believe that you come back to earth. We specifically believe that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after death, straight is the judgment. We believe that. So this is one fundamental belief about Christianity is that there is life after death. The fact that there is life after death puts a check that everything we we'll do now will be translated into eternity. We believe that we are sojourners upon the face of the earth and there is, that there is a, another form of life called eternity, right? And Jesus said so much about that. Um, when, we, when we come into how we arrive at these fundamental beliefs, we will look at them in detail, right? The last one before we give room for contributions, discussions, or anything like that, we believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every congregation, every group that calls themselves Christians and do not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ are not Christians. They may be something else. They may have a form of Christian. They may sing hymns and sing psalms but they are not Christians. Christians believe in the bodily. That word bodily there is conscious. There are some people that believe that Jesus Christ resurrected. Uh, Jesus did not actually come to life physically, that he came in his spiritual body. That it was his spiritual body, not his physical body, right? And, and if you look at some of those claims, they are not consistent with the Bible. The Bible told us one time Jesus came into the room where the doors were locked, he came into the room and he ate with his disciples. The Bible told us that when he met them fishing, when he, when, uh, um, remember that time when he asked Peter, do you love me? You know, by the time they, they were coming back, he had already prepared breakfast, right? And they ate. Spiritual bodies do not eat. The Bible said Jesus Christ stretched forth his hand and asked Thomas to put his finger there. 
And Thomas said, my Lord and my God, spiritual bodies do not have wounds. And so we believe that Jesus Christ resurrected bodily. Bodily. We believe that you can never find his bones in any grave. Right? Um, in one of our discussions, we'll go to some of the things, uh, a particular tomb that was found in 1980. I think I mentioned it at one point in time. Um, a Canadian, um, a Jewish Canadian uh, professor of archaeology, um, they found a particular tomb that contained an actuary. And people were trying to say that that actuary contained the bones of Jesus Christ. They were even trying to insinuate. They found another, actu uh, another um, actuary in that grave. And it had um, Mag uh, Mary of Mag uh, Magdalene. And they were trying to say that was Mary Magdalene. And they were trying to infer that it simply means that Mary Magdalene um, was married to Jesus and that they even have a son. And they, they, they were trying to insinuate that the disciples or the family of Jesus stole his body after he died and then you know, buried him in the actuary, which was later found. Remember that that rumor had been there even from the very beginning. The high priest and some other people concocted that rumor that the rumor should go around that his disciples stole his body. But the Bible told us that Jesus Christ appeared to many people. So we believe that Jesus Christ resurrected bodily. He, his body came back to life, right? Else, he isn't God. If Jesus Christ did not resurrect, if anybody can prove that Jesus Christ did not resurrect, then Christianity is, is destroyed. In fact, there's nothing like Christianity. Christianity hinges on the fact, on the words of Jesus, that he is God and that he resurrected. And because he resurrected, we know that it has power over life and death. And we know that if we die, no matter how long it takes, we will come back to life. Right? So these are the fundamental um, beliefs about Christianity. With it, not minding the branch of Christianity, whether we are Roman Catholic, whether you are Lutheran, whether you are an Adventist, Pentecostalism, you know, Anglicanism, whatever it is, we believe these five fundamental things about Christianity. Any group of persons you see that disagrees with any of these things, they are not worthy to be called Christians. They are not worthy. Anybody that believes um, that our God is not all knowing, that our God is not, you know, is not omniscient, and He's not, you know, all of that, they are not worthy to be called, they are not Christians. Um, um, by the standard of what we believe. I want to give room here for one or two people to make contributions before we call it a wrap. I have um, um, Prof. Sonny Habro, I have, um, have Dickin Taiwo, I have Prof. Shock, I have several persons here. Anybody willing to contribute, please um, unmute and then um, please speak to us. Thank you. Anybody willing to contribute or perhaps ask questions? We intend to make this as um, interactive as possible as time goes on. It's supposed to be a hangout where we share ideas. Somebody said, I joined late. I don't know if you mentioned um, the baptism, yeah, baptism is one thing we believe, but it's not a fundamental thing, right? Whether you believe on, in baptism or not doesn't stop. We, we, we won't say you're not a Christian because you didn't believe in baptism. But if you don't believe that God exists, you're definitely not a Christian. Um, if you don't believe that the Bible is God's word, you are not a Christian. If you don't believe that we are saved by faith, you believe we can be saved by something else other than faith, then how, how, how on earth can you be a Christian? I mean, what is being a Christian for that matter? If you don't believe that there is life after that, if you believe that today we live, tomorrow we die, that is the end of life. You are definitely not a Christian, right? Because Jesus Christ clearly told us, I go to prepare a place for you. 
I told his disciples, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ resurrected in the bodily form, then you are not a Christian. I can see um, Elder Tawo, should I unmute you? Okay, thank you very much. All right, sir. I, are you hearing me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Okay, that was a beautiful presentation. I, I just want to quickly add that uh, our belief system uh, is fundamental to many of the things we do. Either consciously or unconsciously, uh, we, do, do, we do a lot of things due to things we believe. Uh, either it was the wrong knowledge or uh, knowledge that is wrongly acquired or wrongly interpreted. And that's why uh, teachings like this are is very important uh, for Christians to actually find out who we are, what, what, uh, who do we believe. Uh, over the years, so many people do a lot of things, in fact, they cannot even explain why. But going through this series uh, will make us to be able to beat our chest and to defend our to defend the faith. And that's very key. That's very key. I want to enjoy as many that are on this course to make sure that we uh, keep on coming here on uh, so that as we have a grip of this, uh, let's invite other people too uh, from all the campuses. And I know that the Lord will continue to uh, strengthen us. Thank you very much. Uh, You're welcome, sir. Thank you for your contributions. Yes, like 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 you said, we will, we will go deep down into most of the things we believe in Christian. For instance, we use certain certain words, certain languages in Christianity. We will, by God's grace, go into each and every one of them as much as we can. Why? What is salvation? Why did Jesus Christ have to die? I mean, why did he have to come upon the face of the earth? That the Bible makes us understand that when he was being baptized, a dove, the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove on his head, and then a voice came from heaven and said, This is my beloved son, hear thou him. Why didn't Jesus die in heaven? And a voice should just tell us that look, somebody has died, believe him. Why did he have to come in form of a man? It's a Christian doctrine. We shall look at that, right? We'll, we'll look at that. When we say salvation, when we say justification, when we say sanctification, what do we mean? When Jesus said it is finished, what does what did he mean? Right? We'll look at some of those fundamental, um, some of those doctrinal issues, right? And the doctrinal issues, there might be some disagreement based on, you know, where we are, but the fundamental ones we are covering today, there should be no disagreement at all. There should be no disagreement that God exists. Once you believe, once you say God does not exist, then you are basically not a Christian. He that must worship him must first believe that he is. That means he exists. And then there is a reward out there that diligently seek him. But first that he exists. You must believe that the Bible is God's word. We must believe that the Bible is God's word. We must believe that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ, and we must believe that there is life after death. Um, several times in the Bible, we see the word sleep being used to represent death, as if that there is a transition to um, another side. And then we look at the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. We'll pick each of these things. Um, I have a fear in my heart that what I, what I hear and what I see following the internet happening in the Western world might soon begin to happen in Africa where churches are largely becoming empty or the young people are, are leaving the church because they, they don't know what they believe and then when they are faced with beliefs from other systems, they begin to disbelieve what they think they believe or change their mind and gradually Christianity is losing its grip in some of these areas. And I'm believing that with, with, with this ministry, we'll be able to achieve that. Please ask your question. Thank you so much. Somebody said, um, we are saved by grace, not by works. If it were works, Jesus would not have died for us. But even before we were born, while we are yet sinners, 
Jesus died for us. Our works can never be perfect. If they are not perfect, then how can they be perfect? How can how can they please the perfect God? Yes, it means that if it were to be by works, we can never be saved. Yes, God tried it. God, um, I would say God tried. God gave us the opportunity to prove that we can be saved by works. And then we just couldn't in the Old Testament, right? There were rules and nobody uh, kept it. Yes, um, Nifemi Markinde has a question. Let's hear your question. You can, I, I believe you can unmute yourself and then we'll begin to wrap up for tonight to return next Sunday. Um, good evening, everybody. I think my question, I think you said you, it will be answered in subsequent classes. I wanted to ask that um, about the fact that you know that you had to die and resurrect and something like that. You know, it, it's just yeah. it's just a question like, like you know, why did he, if we say, okay, he died for our sins, how about people who were not even born when when he died? Like, okay, so he died. Like, how does that, you know, how does that concern me? What does that have to do with me? And then when somebody, when people say something like, oh, he died for our sins, he was bruised, he was beaten and bruised. And he mm. took um, he took the beatings. I said, people will say, we beat him, we made him. Those people killed him. They killed mm. him. So, the, so, you know, the point is that, okay, but I wasn't even born when they killed him. I wasn't even there when they wrongly accused him. So how does that have to do with me? Why does it now, why do I now have to defend totally on him? For somebody that I literally have no hands in what, you know, what offense was committed against him that led to his death at that point in time. And if it was that he needed to die, why did they have to beat him for him to die? Like, you know, like if, if it was like that, why didn't he just come to earth and then maybe I don't know. Maybe he could. Why, why did he have to? Why did they have to be killed like a criminal? Yes. Why did they? Why did they? Have, yes, exactly. Why did they have to kill him? And then when we, when they say they kill him, he now looks as if we're the ones responsible for his death <laughs> because his we death. killed yes. him, even when we weren't even born. It's an intelligent question, and like I said, we'll come to we'll come to that part. We'll come to that part. We'll go to the part where even the scriptures more than 2,000 years before Jesus Christ was born in the bodily form had predicted how he's going to die, how none of his bones will be broken, how his, his blood and his body will be pierced and blood and, uh, and, um, and water will gush out, how he'll be led like a, a, like a sheep to the sharer and he will utter no words. All of those things have been predicted, right? Which is why we said the Christian God, if we must continue we must come to agreement that these things are true about the Christian God, right? That he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, omnipotent, and that he sees the end from the beginning. To us, it looks like we were not born. In his eyes, it's like we were born, he's seen our birth and death and everything at the same time. To him, all of those things is just a blip in time, right? But like I said, we will come to, to that point and we'll break it. For now, we'll start building the argument from does God exist or God does not exist? And then we'll start going down gradually into, after we've been able to prove the point for Christianity, we'll now begin to pick each of the um, sub-doctrines in Christianity and start breaking them down in form of an inductive Bible study um, and arrive at how did we come, we'll be answering the question, how did we arrive at this doctrine? How did we conclude that this is true, right? We'll check from the Bible, we'll check from other historical sources outside the Bible, right? Um, I hope we know that aside um, the writings of the apostles, there were other uh, erudite people that had writings around the same time that Jesus Christ was alive. And we can put some of those things side by side and see where they where they um, where they agree and come to some of those discussions. So yes, thank you for your question. We'll be addressing that. At this right, point, we we'll want you're welcome. You're welcome. We we'll want to um, let me pause um, the recording right now. <laughs> 